Good morning. Welcome to worship here at First Congregational Church of Benzonia, United Church of Christ, here in beautiful Benzonia, Michigan. For those of you that are joining us on Facebook Live, if you would please put into the chat where you are watching and joining us from so that we may know where our neighbors and friends are, that would be fantastic. And I hope that you've received the order of worship and that you have whatever format that's convenient for you, downloaded it so that you may follow along. I draw your attention to the announcements that are printed in the back of the bulletin. First and foremost, um, welcome to Family Fun Day here at church, a fall festival. Um, please stay. I think Beth's going to give some other information on that. Um, stay for the fun. Highlights in the back of the bulletin is that daylight savings time ends next week. So fall back an hour next Saturday night, or you'll be here as early as I am in the morning. Um, it's also going to be All Saints Day, a uh, new membership, there'll be a baptism. But for All Saints Day, if you have a beloved that has passed this year, please put their name on the All Saints cloth out in Fellowship Hall. There are markers there to write their names. To make sure you do that. And then there's all kinds of stuff coming down the pike. We're going to have a very busy month, but I'm not going to overload everyone. Other announcements for the good of the community today. Good morning. Welcome to Fall Festival Day. Um, after church, we will be showing a movie, which is Hocus Pocus. Sarah's making popcorn. We have a spread of food that's Halloween themed and some residents. And also, we have a raffle that we're holding. And we have uh, door prizes. We have a guess how many candy corn in one container and M&Ms in the other. So please sign up for those things over here. Um, raffle tickets are, five, are of a dollar a piece or six for five dollars. And stop by and pick those up. And all funds raised for that are for our international service project for Christian education. And we have, we'll be making fall themed wreaths. We'll be doing book of spells, brownies, and we have mini charcuterie boards that we're going to be putting together and a little box that is to go. So lots of fun little treats for everyone of all ages. And we also are doing trick or treat for Toys for Tots. And when Carolina gets here, yay, she's here. So <laughs> um, we, We'll have the, um, we have the bucket over there, the cauldron, and there's a glass um, jar inside of that that you can put your change or your dollar bills into. And that also, once again, will go for uh, Toys for Tots of Benzie County. Oh, yeah, the casserole auction. Two weeks from today is the casserole auction. You all are familiar with that. It's a very competitive um, day here at this church. And we are still looking for people who would like are interested in donating um, casserole or soup. If you're interested, please let me know, and I'll get you the containers. And it um, starts at 10 o'clock, um, right before church. You can start bidding, and it'll, a half or say a half hour after church, um, it'll end. So we have that, and this is the last week to get your linens in for bacon, for big, for big, for the month of October. And on the 1st of November, we start collecting Barbies, blocks, ball, um, balls, what? Board games. Yep, <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> and those will be in the cart, and those will go to Toys for Tots for Benzie County. Thank you. I have, I think, four cards on the table with Bible verses, and uh, it's for the jail, so if you would like to write on those cards, I've written the rest of them, uh, I would appreciate it. And uh, if you think to pray for Bill, he's been having some illness, and I would appreciate that too. Thank you. Next week is our quarterly meeting, and that will be followed by a potluck. So please plan to stay and bring a dish to pass. 
Any other announcements? For those of you that have signed up to be delegates um, at the annual conference meeting, there are blue packets on the communion table in Fellowship Hall for you. Um, it's got all the information in it that you ever thought that you needed for annual meeting. Um, all the resolutions are in there and a the schedule and all the, the budget, all of that fun stuff. For those of you that are not signed up as delegates and you would like to come to the United Northern Association's fall meeting, that is next Friday at 3.15, 3 o'clock in room C up at Crystal Mountain. So if you go into the main lodge and just look for room C, that is where our, our fall meeting will be happening during annual conference. So come and hear what's happening um, in the UNA. There's no charge to be there. You don't need to register ahead of time. Just come on in for that meeting. But for the delegates, there are blue bundles out there. Or anybody who wants that information, it's out on the communion table in Fellowship Hall. I draw your attention then, or draw you into the time of prayer, or at least joys and concerns, those places where we have giggled and those places where we have wept this week. There was an absolutely beautiful service yesterday for Joe's sister, Dory. Um, the church was full. Um, Joe shared beautiful words about her sister. Um, so to continue to, to keep Skip and Joe in your prayers as they look at what life is like without Dory as part of Watervale down there, although I think that the, her legacy will live long and loud um, through the wait staff and the way they've been trained. There was lots of stories about that. But I also um, ask you to pray for Ron and Nina today um, as they grieve uh, sister-in-law's passing this week. Um, so uh, Robin Gervin passed away this week, and that's their sister-in-law to, to continue to hold them in prayer as well. I saw John Riegler yesterday, and Barb is back out at the Homesteader. So she's been released from Paul Oliver. So she is home. Um, anybody who wants to stop out and see them, please do so. She would love to have the company. Are there other joys and concerns? Sarah's coming. I have both the joy and a concern. The concern first is a young lady in Flushing, my friend's daughter, and she has a nodule on her pancreas. It's been removed twice in the last four years, and now it's spreading. So my friend is asking for prayers for her daughter that she does not have cancer. And her, her name is Susan Curtis. And I have a joy, my niece, I'll get the right name, Julie Morris is here. <laughs> and she is, uh, it's her birthday, first of all. And for those people who remember, her grandma was uh, Ethel Stormer, who lived here and went to church here many years. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have two joys. Today's my husband's birthday. Um, and he's 69 years old, and um, I had a biopsy this week on my thyroid, and everything is fine. Nothing is, Yay. nothing is cancerous, so it's all good. Then let us take a moment to lift up all of our grief, all of our worries, all of our rejoicing, new birth and birthdays, recovering from illnesses, all of those things that we encounter every day, all of the words that are heavy upon our hearts, and lift them up to God. Amen. I invite you to take a deep breath. 
know that God is here. Take a deep breath and know that you are held tenderly by the Holy Spirit. Take a deep breath. Know the love of Jesus. Let us prepare for worship. Good morning. Welcome to this beautiful fall day. It looks like fall has finally really arrived and uh, we all enjoy the beauty of the colors. Would you now join me in the call to worship? Look to the Holy One and be radiant. Bless God at all times. We praise God who is with us. We honor God who sustains redeems, and delivers. Look to the Holy One and be radiant. Boost in the Holy One. We seek the Holy One who hears our cries with grace, mercy, and compassion. Look to the Holy One and be radiant. Magnify God with me. Who we'll taste and see, hear and proclaim, touch and know God Bless the Holy One. We can now join together with our first hymn, Sing Them Over Again to Me. It's an insert in your bulletin. Please all stand if you are able or willing, and uh, we will join together in song.
May we all together, gather together in prayer together. Loving God, it is good to be with you in the company of the assembly. When we seek you, we find you. When we pray, you respond. When we listen, your voice sounds. Make your presence palpable in the places we gather. We come to be formed, informed, and transformed by your lavish and bountiful love of, of your glory and for you you hold within your heart. Amen. Please be seated. This morning's reading um, is from Job, from the, last, the Old Testament. Um, today we reach the end of the book of Job and we learn of God's grace, that God will always be with us, and that God rewards us even in the face of Satan. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered that I did not understand things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I heard of you by hearing of the ear, but now my eye has seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comfor comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, and he had 14,000 shrimp, or shrimp, sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons, and three daughters. He named the first Gemaniah, the second Kisa, 
and the third, Karin Haputch. In all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children four generations. And Job died old and full of days. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark. We continue to work our way through that gospel. It is the 10th chapter, verses 46 through 52. Let us have ears wide open to hear the stories anew that we know by heart. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Tinnemus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out loud and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even louder, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still, call him here. And they, being the villagers, called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, my teacher, Rabboni, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on his way. May we be blessed by the reading, hearing, and pondering of God's holy word. The word in that scripture that jumped out at me this week is the word again. Let me see again. Speaks to the fact that he already had vision. It implies that. We skip over that word. Let me see is what we hear. This translation and several of them say, let me see again. Again, we are now in the time of stewardship. Most of you would have received your envelopes by now in the mail. We put them out last Thursday. Again, it is stewardship time. But it is a month that we're hoping that there is lots of imagination. A month of imagination. Today we get to see anew. We get to see again where our imaginations might be. Next week, we will see what the church can be, how we be the church, because there is lots of stuff going on next week. It is a busy, busy day. In fact, I don't even have to do a sermon next week because we've got enough liturgy to take up a full hour. And then we'll have Lawrence Richardson, Reverend Richardson here to talk to us about vitality and what vitality looks like and what stewardship looks like. And then we have Thanksgiving a time to be grateful. So again, we will be moving our way through stewardship, looking at our life together, how we work together, but more so our imagination of what we can do together. And I think the story of Bartimaeus helps us a little bit with that, because he asks to be able to see again. Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy on me, he calls out. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And his fellow townspeople are mortified. Be quiet. You're a hollering maniac. Shh. 
And I bet some of them were rude enough to come right out and downright say, shut up. We don't need to hear your voice today. This one celebrity that we get to come to town, this one person of importance that we get to follow, which I think there's probably a lot more people, but they're following Jesus in this. It is Jericho, the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. And you yell at him like the village idiot. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Shh. He doesn't have the time for the likes of you. Bartimaeus doesn't care. He knows Jesus has what he needs, and he's going to go after it. He will not be silenced. We could learn a lot about the boldness in Bartimaeus. We could learn a lot about asking for what we need. Bartimaeus is a blind beggar. Think about that. He lives, Bartimaeus lives in complete uncertainty every day, all the time. He didn't know if and when he would get food. Being a beggar, he waits for people passing by to pass him nourishment. We don't know who helps care for him, who helps assist him moving from one space to another, if he needs assistance as a presumption of ours. He is on the road of Jericho. This is the story, this is the place where the story of the Good Samaritan takes place. It's a dangerous highway between Jerusalem and Jericho. Lots of traffic. Lots of people from different tribes and different ethnicities passing each other, not always liking each other, causing grief and mayhem. He didn't know if someone was going to hurt him or help him. He did not know if he would eat or if he would die on any given day. His existence is completely dependent upon the contingency of the choices of other people. Right. He was at the mercy of those that he could not see. And all of the time and in every way, he had to look forward to and probably couldn't even imagine what that future might look like. Bartimaeus can't see Jesus coming down the road. He can't see the group of people. And I know lots of us have vision issues in this room. I don't have my everyday glasses on, so I know there are people sitting out there, but I can't, well, I can tell who you are, but it's blurry. I don't know how I would feel if I could not actually see who's out there. I could only hear that you're about. Right? That's how people with vision impairments get through life as they hear things a little bit better. So Bartimaeus hears this crowd coming down the road, and I'm, I'm a presuming that he's hearing the name Jesus floating around, that he knows that it's Jesus, the man from Nazareth, that's coming. And all he can do is cry out, shout out, mercy. Have mercy on me. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, son of David. He can identify who Jesus is, even though Jesus has never stopped to talk to him. Where the disciples can't name it all the time, Bartimaeus knows. He knows. But even more important than Bartimaeus' persistence in this story is Jesus' response to him. Bartimaeus is hollering, and he's causing such a ruckus. And Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart. Take heart. Get up. Jesus is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up. And he goes to Jesus. He kneels in front of Jesus. And if I picture the scene in my head, Jesus puts his hands on Bartimaeus' shoulders and says, what can I do for you? This is the same question that we heard last week when James and John go up to Jesus and say, before we tell you what we want, we need you to promise that you're going to do it for us. 
And Jesus, without asking what that is, says, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus doesn't make presumptions. Jesus doesn't presume to know what Bartimaeus needs. He asks directly, what can I do for you? And I think this is one of the most important moments in the entire part of the Gospels reading that we've been working through for telling us about who Jesus is. Jesus does not assume that Bartimaeus wants to have his sight restored. He does not assume that Bartimaeus sees his blindness as a disability. Bartimaeus could have been asking for a new jacket or a good meal or shelter. Jesus doesn't presume to know what he wants. Although I think in the back of Jesus' mind, he knows exactly what Bartimaeus wants. He seems to know what all of these healing stories are. But Bartimaeus seeks Jesus, and Jesus does not force him. Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus doesn't impose his will on us either, or make any assumptions about what we need or what we want. He asks us as openly as he asks Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And by asking this one question, Jesus provides us with a mechanism to delve deeper, to delve deeper into our lives with him and with God. It's a deceptively simple question. Right? We ask that of other people all the time. What do you want me to do for you? How can I help you? What do you need from me? We ask these questions probably five, six times a day. Right? On the surface, it seems that the matter is a value exchange. What can we earn or get from our relationship with Jesus? But if we spend time with the question, we find new truths opening up in ourselves new truths opening up with our relationship with God and with each other. So let's sit with that question for just a few minutes. As I like to do, paint you a picture to give you a scene. Jesus is actually here in the building. He's come to visit one day, and it's coffee time, and he goes and he gets his snacks. He'll go and get his grapes and his cheese and crackers and whatever delectable yummies are out there. Today will be a bag of popcorn and some brownies. And he goes down to your table. And I'm going to say your table because we all have our own specific tables where we sit, just like we have our seats here, we have our places. Jesus joins you at your table, takes a sip of his coffee, eats a few grapes, and then looks you right square in the eyes and says, what can I do for you today? No small talk. No, how you doing? How are the grandchildren? How was vacation? When do you leave again? What can I do for you? What do you want me to do for you? How would you answer that? I'm going to take the 50-foot view on this, and perhaps one of our answers would be, well, first of all, Jesus, it would be great if you just make the church successful. Just make the churches successful. And I can only imagine that he picks up his coffee cup and takes another sip and looks over the top of it and says, really? What do you want me to do for you? Could you just make all of our membership worries go away and all of our financial burdens go away, that we will be solvent and full and vibrant and going for at least, you know, the next 75 years or so. Won't ask forever, but just, you know, just a lifetime. Wouldn't that be great? But I don't think that's truly what is at the bottom of our hearts. We know because he's asking us again, what do you want me to do for you? Okay, let's see if we can peel back one more layer and be a little bit more vulnerable. Could you make us as successful as disciples and ministers? 
as the people that followed you. No, maybe that's not it. But we're getting deeper. What do you want me to do for you? Help us to do more, to try harder, to be better. What was what we say to Jesus? Getting closer to the truest desire of our hearts. But are we there yet? Help us love people more. Help us love people better. Help us to be better disciples for your name. And finally, Jesus has finished his brownies and his coffee, and he looks at you again, and he says, what do you want me to do for you? We've gotten through all the layers. What's on your heart? Teacher, Rabone, let me see again. Let me see again. Bartimaeus' words become our words. Let us see how loved we are. Let us see how hungry for love others are. How worthy of love we all are. How precious and beautiful and wonderful our neighbors are. Let us see that all of this love has come from you, Jesus. All of this love has come from God, the creator. All of this love is held together with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Teacher, let me see again. Help us to see the imagination of how we can bring forth your kingdom into this place and space. Digging down through all of the immediate superficial answers, down through fear, down through ego, down through all the concerns of this world, we find the desire at the core of our being, which is the desire to give and to receive love, the desire to give and receive God. Teacher, let me see again. Let us see that below all the noise and through all the distractions and beyond all the divisions that can isolate us from one another is the presence, the presence of the Holy One that outlasts the stars. That is what we want you to do for us, Jesus. Let us see the love. Let us share that love. Now, the story of Bartimaeus, it occupies a very unique niche in the stories, both his story of healing and the call story. It's the healing that enables his call. It's his healing that allows him to get up and follow Jesus. And it's the final ingredient to his healing. Jesus said to him, go, go. Your faith has healed you. Bartimaeus doesn't turn around and walk away. He follows Jesus. And I think this is worth a closer look in our own lives, this relationship between healing and call, how very short that distance is between the two, how intermingled they can be. Often we feel unequipped to answer the call Jesus places on our lives. I can speak from my own experience. I listened to that call for a very long time. And it's like, yep, I'm too broken to do that. I'm not qualified to go out and be a minister. I don't know how to do that. I don't have time. And if you knew all my backstory, you really wouldn't want me to do this. We are broken people. We are mixed up people. We are apathetic people. We are trapped in a net of responsibilities and habits that seem so inescapable, even for the work of sharing the good news. How could someone as unhealed as we are do something so radical for Jesus? But we don't have to wait for healing to answer Jesus' call. Bartimaeus doesn't wait. The people in the crowd say immediately, take heart, get up, he's calling you. 
So throwing off his cloak, he springs up and he comes to Jesus, still blind, relying on no guidance from the townspeople around him, reacting with joy and abandonment. He throws away his cloak and he goes both to and with Jesus. This is not an insignificant moment in his life or in ours. Bartimaeus was homeless. He's a blind beggar living on a very dangerous highway. His cloak is his only asset. It is his only protection from the weather and the cold. The closest thing to shelter that he has, I'm sure it holds whatever small possessions he might have, and he casts it away without a second thought. He gets up and takes it off before he even takes a step. He's still blind, he's still unhealed, and he answers the call to make his way to Jesus. His hope and his imagination of what life can be just preceding him, leading him, giving him the hope and the courage to take that next step, the imagination of what life can be. And in perhaps the most remarkable turn in this whole story is Barnabas is not the only one healed and called in this story. Did you catch who else had a radical conversion? It was at the beginning of my sermon, it was in the reading. Jesus does not call Barnabas. The crowd does. The story begins with them being cruel and exclusionary. Be quiet. He doesn't have time for you. You have no worth. And in all rudeness, shut up. Stop calling. Lower your voice. Go away. Doing everything they can to keep Bartimaeus out of the way of Jesus. Men, man, many sternly ordered him to keep quiet. But he cried out even more loudly. Son of David! Son of David, have mercy on me. And it was at this pivotal moment that Jesus does not call Bartimaeus directly. He calls to the crowd. And he tells the crowd, call him. Call him to me. Call him here. And then the redemption. So easy to skip over if you're not paying close attention. They called the blind man, saying to him, take heart. They are encouraging him. Jesus is calling you. Get up. Come on. Let's go. That's the moment of the crowd's conversion, the crowd's healing, healing the crowd's call. This is the moment of the crowd moving forward. Jesus' love is sneaky and so powerful that it broke open their hardened hearts, and they probably didn't even notice it in the moment. It would be upon reflecting at the end of the day going, what happened? Hmm. They go from trying to keep people away from Jesus to urging them forward. They go from seeing Bartimaeus as an embarrassment and trying to shut him up and then to keep him hidden to telling him to take heart and go forward into Jesus' embrace from exclusion to inclusion. Oh, that we could see again. So what we learn here in this call, it's never individual. We hear a call of community. Bartimaeus calls for Jesus. Jesus calls to the crowd. The crowd calls Bartimaeus. It can be almost part of the John's gospel. It's so circular. Bartimaeus follows in. Jesus is on the way. This entire process of call and response is deeply healing to everyone involved. Imagine being in that space. Imagine what life would be like. So where do we start? We listen and we call out to Jesus just as Bartimaeus did. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, son of David. Have mercy on us. Because Jesus is always calling and always healing. And it begins with his simple question to us. 
What do you want me to do for you? So let us take Bartimaeus' words to our heart. Teacher, Rabone, let us see again. Amen. I invite you as you are able in body or spirit to stand and lift your voices to our hymn, Open My Eyes That I May See. It is inserted in the bulletin. Please be seated. I invite you now into a spirit of prayer. However, you speak with a still speaking God this morning. Eyes opened, eyes closed, eyes full of tears. Hands gently folded or grasping for the neighbor, reaching for God. However, you speak with a still speaking God this morning. It was a despairing Job who prayed for his friends. It was Job who had lost everything, who asked God's blessings on others. It was Job who found restoration in his concern for others. Holy One, loving and gracious God, Creator, we despair at the state of our world and the actions of many within it, and so we have nothing to lose in offering our prayers for friends and strangers, those known and unknown to us. We pray today believing that you will rekindle hope where it has been lost, 
and living where there is mere life, among family and friends where there is strife and conflict, we pray for reconciliation. Between countries and faiths who speak through bombs and bullets, send peace. To the refugee, forced from home and unsure of the future, give comfort. For the abused and the destitute, give a place of safety. And as we pray for our friends, Holy Creator, reconcile us to you and to one another. Help us to share the riches of your grace with those around us, that our days and theirs may be full of love and light. And that through your holy imagination, we all might be one. And in the words that your son taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are God-centered, we are Christ-formed, and we are spirit-led. I can talk today. And God loves us all in a way that we can show that love between each other and our community and the greater world is through our offertory. So whether if you gave it to the plate in Fellowship Hall, mailed it to the front office, or hit the donate button on the website, I invite you to stand that we may together bless this morning's offertory. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Loving God, bless us with increased generosity, trust, and faithfulness. Receive these gifts as an offering of praise. May needs be met, lives be changed, and hearts be warmed through our giving. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning can be found in the red hymnal, page 223, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing.
I invite you now to turn to your neighbors north, south, east, and west, and if you need to travel for a handshake or a hug this morning, by all means, to share the sign of the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. Brothers and sisters of Jesus, all of us siblings under God, may we leave this place strengthened by God's love. May we leave this place held in God's goodness. May we leave this place enriched in God's generosity. May we hold all of those things because we're going to go out and do the hard things in the power of the Holy Spirit to love our neighbors with the love of Jesus Christ today and every day. Amen. And I think instead of doing a round today, we'll just do it all together. Go now in peace. And if you need the words, they're in the pew racks. <laughs>